Visit avery.com, A-V-A-R-Y, for the most up-to-date news and information on Team Avery. 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 The Video Archives podcast with Quentin Tarantino and Roger Avery is back for season two. Head on over to patreon.com slash video archives to get ad-free exclusive content and bonus episodes. This is The Gala Show. I'm your reporter on the beat, Gala Avery. On season two of The Gala Show, I'm inviting back prior guests who told me that my 30-minute time limit was just not enough for them. For the month of November, he's a writer who introduced the term anti-biopic into the zeitgeist. Last time he was on the show, he sat down and chatted with me about L.A. movies. This time, he's got a totally new topic, and we're ready to bite into it. Returning to the mic is the dude with the Psyduck tattoo, Larry Karaszewski. <laughs> hey, Larry. Hello there. I love that you you are the you are one of the the main people who are, who's obsessed with my Psyduck I am tattoo. Obsessed with your Psyduck Thank tattoo. Thank you. Thank and you. I know on your water bottle you have a Jigglypuff. Yes, I do because I didn't I couldn't find a I couldn't find a Psyduck um uh um I couldn't find sticker? a Psyduck sticker. Okay, well maybe I know but what you're going to get good. for Christmas yes. slash Hanukkah Ooh. this year. Jigglypuff. I used to play. I don't know if your kids ever played it, but like Pokemon Snap which was a game on the Nintendo 64. Yes, 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 yes. And then there's like a level in the cave where the Jigglypuff, if you throw the right thing at it, it'll start singing. Oh. And then it'll get really mad and it'll yes, draw with Yes, the... yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I remember that, actually. It's so fun. I think I, 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 think I walked in the room when that <laughs> happened. Well, it's great. I have, a, I have a... My niece just had a child. Not just had a child. was like four years old. So mm-hmm. we're actually introducing the ye old timey Pokemon oh, that's series wonderful. to them. I love so it. So it's really good. Yes, 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 yes. That's the best. So before we bring up the topic for today, I have a question for you. I'm kind of obsessed with this topic recently because people used to ask this to like me and my dad. And then every time I'm interviewing people that have children, I've started getting really interested in asking them mm-hmm. this. So when you showed your children movies when they were younger, how did you decide what movies to show them? Well, um, I think because of my childhood, uh, I was uh, into showing them just about everything. Uh, you know, I didn't really have the age appropriate thing going on i would you know i <laughs> i would show my daughter and my son all kinds of crazy things because i think it's very important to introduce a wide variety of movies to kids early on i think because we're in the in the um uh, the narrow casting universe now where everything is aimed directly at you so a lot of kids just grow up on nickelodeon or disney or cartoons um uh you know i felt it was important to show them some subtitled movies, show them some black and white movies really early on. Um, I'm giving some foreshadowing there. But it was important that they <laughs> that they see things that, that aren't necessarily aimed at them and, and allow them to get bored. They get bored and then all of a sudden something crazy, oh my God, that, they just murdered that guy. You know what yeah. I mean? And so it became this really cool thing. And I used to, when before my son came along, my daughter and I had this thing where I would uh, I think it was on Easter. We'd how, wake up. how far apart age-wise They're are They're only they? two years apart. It's like me and but, my brother, yeah. But, um, you know, it took a while for my son to, to catch up a little bit because my daughter was like four and he was two, you know. So, yeah. But we would wake up the evening before Easter and we'd dye some eggs and we'd watch some crazy thing. And I remember showing her like love story or something really? or valley of the doll or some kind of weird thing like that but i would show them double indemnity i would show them all kinds of uh, odd movies and then once i got into the 70s i showed them everything way before they were uh, 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 appropriate to see it so they would you know they would always say to me dad dad can you show us a movie where they don't die at the end and i was like no when they die at the end it's great and I knew my work was 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 I, I did good work because when I think my daughter was like seventeen or eighteen and my son was like fifteen or sixteen, um, they both had dates uh, uh, the same night on a Saturday night, and they ran into each other at a revival theater in L.A. at a screening of La Dolce Vita. And I was like, they dragged their dates to La, Do- La Dolce Vita separately without not without consulting each other. I was like, yes, yes. Wow. You knew that you succeeded as a father exactly. in that moment. Exactly. Exactly. Now, as always, my guest gets to bring their topic to the mic. So, Larry, why don't you tell us what your topic is and why you decided to choose it? Well, it's funny. We, I mentioned that I would show my kids black and white movies, and that is that is the topic of my uh, of, uh, of the show today. And it's not just black and white movies. Um, it's black and white movies in the color era. 
uh, sort of past 1970. Um, uh, and, I, and I actually I picked that topic because it's, it's now the, uh, we're, uh, we just had a big uh, anniversary screening of Ed Wood at the American Cinematheque. And um, uh, it really made me realize how, how lucky I am to have made a movie in black and white. There's so few people who've made a, a film in black and white during this time period. And, um, uh, and it started making me thinking of like, oh, who else made a black and white movie during this time? And why did they make it? And, and uh, how was it received? All those kind of questions started coming up. Because, um, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I remember uh, when I told uh, my sister back in Indiana that we were making Ed Wood in black and white, she said, oh, I'm so sorry. Wow. Oh, I'm so sorry. She really thought like, oh my God, Larry, Larry, Larry's even, he skipped porn. He went straight to black and white. He's, his career's in gigantic trouble. She didn't realize it was a badge of honor. She thought it was just like, oh, he's making black and white movies. No, wow. Wow, well, I hope he's okay. But before we get into the topic, here's a commercial break. Back by popular demand, the Video Archives merch store is up and running. Get your favorite t-shirts, hats, notebooks, stickers, and more at videoarchivesmerch.com. You know me. I write all my notes in the Notes on Cinema Notebook, the Gall edition, of course. Check out videoarchivesmerch.com to get yours today. Hey, thanks so much for being a loyal listener. If you want to keep up with me off mic, make sure to follow me on Instagram at Gala Avery. And we're back. So that's our topic for today, black and white films in the color era. I have 30 minutes on the clock, and Larry also yeah. has 30 minutes on the clock as well. <laughs> I make sure I get every second. And our time starts now. There we go. Yeah, Larry knew to bring his own that's clock funny. today. Oh, shoot. I'm just going to trust you. My thing is, my thing, my thing we're back to zero. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and Edward was great because Edward was never intended to uh, a great experience because Edward was never intended to be a color movie. I mean, a well, black and white movie. I was, oh, it was never it was, intended no, no, to be no. Black I mean, white. we wrote it. We assumed it'd be in color. There was no reason to, you know, necessarily think that it was going to make it in, in black and white. And um, uh, it wasn't until we were doing um, camera tests and makeup tests for Martin Landau's Bella Lugosi. We were trying to see if, uh, you know, if if how much he looked like Bella with Rick Baker's makeup. And every time we would shoot it. Uh, um, you know, he just didn't quite look old and decrepit enough. And um, at one point, St Stefan Chapsky, who was a cinematographer, just walked over to the monitor and he turned off the color. And when he turned off the color, it just snapped right away. In the, and it was like, oh, my God. And Tim was like, oh, I don't think I've ever seen a, a color photo of Bela Lugosi. There are a few. But he had never. And he was just like, oh, this is incredible. These, well, this movie is about black and white people. Yeah, that's the thing about yeah. the movie. So I always assumed that Ed Wood was meant to be in black and white right. because it's kind of the black and white era. It's the black and white yes, people. Yes, correct, correct. But, uh, wow, but yeah, no, so that, that's what made it. And actually, that, that, uh, the studio refused to do it. Uh, Columbia refused to make it in black and white, and we went and turned around, and uh, and Disney uh, Touchstone picked us up, luckily, and we were able to make it in black wow. and white. And and actually, uh, uh, Columbia had said, um, "Well, why don't you shoot in color neg, and we can print it in black and white if you want to. We can make the decision later." And Tim always felt he was being like, you know, flim flammed a little bit by that, because there are movies like I think John Borman's The General which was uh, released initially as uh, in black and white in theaters. But when you see it on cable, there's just a little tiny bit of color been brought in so it actually, you know, they can sell it in packages. And Tim was always feeling, ah, someday I'm going to be in Brazil and I'm going to turn on TV and Edward's going to be in color and I don't want that to happen. Yeah, and you're going to be like, what is this? My vision has been completely... <laughs> and he, Tim yeah. Burton eventually, he also did Frankenweenie mm -hmm. in black and white. Yeah, funny enough, he did he did Frank and Weenie as a short in black and white before us, and Frank and Weenie as an animated film afterwards in black and white, which is sort of cool. There are very few uh, animated black and white films of this time period. I think per Persepolis might yeah. be the the only one that really comes to mind right away. 
So <clears throat> why does someone choose black and white over color in like this kind of color era? Yeah, there's a bunch of different reasons. I mean, you know, it gives you a sense of timelessness. It definitely gives you a sense of nostalgia. There's a lot of movies that sort of hark back to different eras of filmmaking. Um, you know, they, you got so much, uh, uh, you know, when you remove color, you can concentrate more on other things, the shadows and light, the contrast. Um, I think it's a way to evoke the past in a big way. Um, you know, and what's interesting interesting is uh, I think uh, my delineation is around 1967 and I think that's the point where it becomes you know a deliberate artistic decision versus like uh you know like a, a, cost a decision? technical or a cost kind of thing I'm you know I'm, I'm not an expert at this so I have some of my my things might be wrong but I'm really kind of considering in cold blood the Richard Brooks uh, uh movie uh that that uh, that that Conrad um uh, what's his name? Uh, Conrad Hall shot that looks unbelievable. That that shot of uh, where, where, where Robert Blake is waiting to be executed in the rain is really just an amazing thing. A beautiful, beautiful film. Um, as kind of the last big uh, um, studio film made in black and white, that mm -hmm. as just a, a natural kind of thing. I mean, all throughout the sixties, almost every film was in color, but you'd still have a Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf or Seven Days in May or things like that. <clears throat> And after 67, it kind of just didn't happen anymore. It sort of moved over to, like, low-budget stuff. You'd still have Night of the Living Dead or Cassavetti's Faces. it's cheaper to shoot yeah. on black and white than it is for color. Yeah, Honeymoon Killers is another one that comes to mind. And I think it's kind of not until, I'd say, Bogdanovich in 1971 when he does Last Picture Show, where that's, you know, that's Columbia Pictures. Um and that is a deliberate artistic choice. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, I think uh, for many different reasons. One is the, the nostalgia for the for the fifties. It really matches that um, that sort of like the you know there's Hank Williams on the soundtrack. It sort of feels. I mean, it is the last picture show. So when you yeah. open you open on that street and that movie theater and the and the and the dust is blowing around, it feels like it's a once again black and white people. It's a black and white town. So Larry shared with me this amazing list that he has on Letterbox, which is black and white. Uh, films in the color era right. and so I was able to go through and it's kind of amazing how many there are mm -hmm. because you kind of think as you said like nowadays it's just it's color 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 but we even have like modern films like I saw the artist in theaters yes. like four or five yes. times and yeah. that was black and white yeah but when you're talking about like movies that make you go back in time you mentioned the last picture show yeah. paper moon is another yeah, one paper moon I mind. mean so it's really funny Bogdanovich stuck with it where paper moon is the is is uh he makes uh, well it's a document between but Paper Moon, so, I mean, Paper Moon is unbelievable. It's such a great film. It's one of the, my favorite viewing experiences I ever had with my dad. Yeah. So it's like a movie I hold like really dear to my yeah. heart and just like that it is in black and white. And you mentioned earlier like showing your kids things. Yes, that, like, I showed them and that earlier. My dad on. showed me that also. I remember exactly where I was I'm when I saw chills, Paper Moon. I know. I, yeah. I remember exactly where I was when I saw Paper Moon. Right. I am too now. Yeah. It's like I was, it was a rainy night on an old television in, a, in John Langley's yeah. house that my yeah. dad was in for like the weekend in right. Santa Monica. And it was just, I don't know, it was an amazing experience. And I'm not like a black and white film like lover, mm -hmm. but I love that movie. Yeah. And it's I love so good. That I think it just came out on Criterion, so I can't wait to oh, check I bet it out. But I, 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 you know, but I'll back it up, say that I had that experience when I was a kid. Because wow. I was probably 11 or something when that movie came out. And um, I actually met, I met Tatum O'Neill at uh, actually a Quentin party at one point. And I went up to her and I said, um, you, you might be responsible for me. Being here, being you know, I mean, I, I'd always I've been fascinated with movies, but seeing that movie and seeing oh, like a kid <laughs> my age in that movie and see, and um, and actually she won the Academy Award and I remember watching that ceremony and it was like oh my god a kid can win an Academy Award I maybe I could win an Academy Award I, I didn't win an Academy Award but I wound up being vice president of the Academy but I yeah. think it all starts from seeing Paper Moon and seeing Tatum O'Neill. How did it feel then, like showing your kids that movie after you had had that experience as a kid showing, like seeing it's, it? Well, because it really works. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, she's so great, and it's a, uh, and it's a, uh, you know, it's not a kid movie. It's like she's she's the toughest character in it. Uh, you know, she smokes, she cusses. You know, she's uh, that's why I think made Tatum such a big star at the time. She actually felt like a real person in those movies, and so it wasn't it wasn't a stretch for them. I wasn't showing them, you know, I wasn't showing them some film noir <laughs> or yeah, something. Something you know, that like was yeah. so. Adult. Yeah, like I remember the two adult, movies that went over really, really well. Both have kids in them, black and white movies. That one was Night of the Hunter, and one was Paper Moon. Yeah, you know. For me, another movie that I remember seeing when I was a kid, Neil Gaiman with his daughter Maddie showed me Young Frankenstein. Yes, well, Young Frankenstein was probably the next movie. That's you're doing perfect. Yeah. That actually, that's the next thing I was going to bring up was that 
you know, Bogdanovich is doing these movies kind of on 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 uh, on his own, uh, uh, and then Mel decides to do Young Frankenstein, and that is totally aping a, a style of filmmaking, an earlier style that's mm -hmm. going for nostalgia, it's going for you know what the Frankenstein movies look like, and it's. It's incredibly well shot. It might be Mel's best piece of direction. Oh, for it looks sure. so good. I mean, uh, what's the name of the um, the uh, the DP is uh, Gerald Hirschfeld, and I, I have a Jones for this guy because he also shot all the Frank Perry movies like Last Summer and, and uh, <laughs> of course you Mad love him. Of course you love him. Stuff like that. But he also <laughs> shot, he shot Fail Safe. He does no black and white. But that movie looks so good. It's an it, you know it's an incredible job. And Mel ends up sticking with black and white a little bit because um, I think Stuart Cornfield shows him. Later on in the 70s, uh, uh, David Lynch's Eraserhead, which yeah. was a low-budget black-and-white movie from that era. And Mel, Mel puts him in charge of, of Elephant Man. And David Lynch winds up making Elephant, and which you know is produced by Mel Brooks. Yeah. Mel Brooks did one of the most selfless things ever in filmmaking history: is he took his name off of Elephant Man. Elephant Man was nominated for Best Picture. Mel Brooks produced Elephant Man, but he knew that if his name was on the poster. People would say, "Oh, Mel Brooks is Elephant Man," and they would think it was a comedy of some kind. So he actually removed his name so that it would be David Lynch's vision, and people would uh, would accept it for what it was. That is so selfless and also yeah. necessary because it is a director's vision rather yeah. than the pro like the producers supporting him in creating this yeah, yeah. thing. But it is a director's vision. Yeah, and that movie looks incredible. The Elephant Man is an unbelievable looking film. Um, that's Freddie Francis shoots that, and Fre and Frederick Elm shoots the Razorhead. I mean, I mean, it's when we go through this list. <laughs> Of, uh, of, of DPs. DPs. I mean, uh, it's it's really incredible that the these are some of the greatest DPs of our era. All shot these all shot these films. And the next person I would bring up is kind of related to both Bogdanovich and and, uh, and Mel is Woody Allen, who yeah. you know was sort of the person on his own consistently over decades uh, shooting movies in black and white, starting with um, uh, you know uh, Manhattan, um, uh, you know, and and my my favorite Woody movie is Stardust Memories, which it's, is it's funny incredible. when I think of Woody Allen, I think of black and white. Yeah, I don't necessarily think of a color film. Isn't that funny? And yeah, yeah. It's a funny thing. I always remember like my parents would watch Woody Allen. I'd walk in and I'd see them. My mom does not like Woody Allen movies, but my yeah. dad would try to show right. her Woody Allen movies. Yeah. And I'd walk in, it would always be in black and white. Even if the movie's in color, I remember it being black and white. <laughs> um, but, you know, he, he what is, whatever his black and white movies, Manhattan, Stardust Memories, Zelig, Broadway, Danny Rose, Shadows and Fog, Celebrity. There's so many. There's so many of them. And once again, the best DPs in the world is Gordon Willis for the whole first couple. It is um, Carlo De Palma. It's Sven Nyquist. I mean, these these are these are these are masters. Um, it's also interesting because um, if people are not like if they watch movies but they're not super super into movies, they might not know to look at a DP. Like if you like a movie, right. you can look at the cinematographer, director of photography. Yeah, the director. Of photography. Anyone listening to the Gala Show knows what a DP. Is. <laughs> well, no. I have some friends that yeah. listen, and they're not actually movie people. I have like friends that are nurses who listen. Yeah, yeah. shout out to all, all right. my nurse friends. Hey, that listen. Thank you, nurses. But, uh, I appreciate it. I recently but, had a bad fall, so I appreciate you, nurses out there. But uh, you can look at a cinematographer, and you can track a move, like you can track yes. all their movies, and you might like a cinematographer's movies, not necessarily yeah. a director's filmography. Yeah. So it's interesting when you. No, start just funny. Like I actually that. think the uh, the auteur theory in general is. I don't know. If, I don't really think it's bogus, but I think you can look at other things. You know, what mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at a cinematographer's body of work, you can see a theme. Oh, you, look yeah. at, you look at my body of work. You can see we are, we uh, most most film artists are our tours yeah for sure yeah. when we're talking also about these go back in time movies because i just have to shout out like roma roma was yes. like a really interesting one yeah, that yeah. happened and my dad grew up partially in mexico yeah. and so when he was watching roma even though he's not mexican and he didn't live that exact yeah, yeah. life he felt so connected to that movie and i think it being black and white also did help totally that that is the that is a um i wouldn't compare it too much to the last picture show but it is definitely a guy re-looking at his past and sure. and so it is a nostalgia kind of thing and, and it is you know um uh and there's a sense of realism, you know. He is he is thinking about, it. and that's also that thing that was supported by uh, uh, by Netflix in a gigantic way. Yeah, you know, it was Netflix did in a that, huge and way. Mank, uh, both were in black. Did and you white. like Mank? I like Mank. I, you know, it, once again, that's evoking a certain style. You know, my dad's feeling on Mank. Like no, he, I don't. Oh, is he, he, a, hates oh, he hates Mank. He hates Mank. Yeah. I don't really like Mank yeah, that yeah. much, but it's funny because uh, he was like, "Gala." After we watched Mank, he was like, "Gala, we have to wash our eyes by watching Ken Russell's Valentino." Ah, <laughs> well, God bless. I like both those movies. Um, I know. So that's I know. I know. I understand. I understand, but but the, but the, you know, the, I, I think what the, we're, we're sort of saying is uh, is both with Mank and Roma, you got Alfonso Cuarón, and you've got uh, you got Fincher. You know, at a certain point, you need to have gigantic clout. 
yeah, to make these black and white movies because they will not. Period. Yeah, they will not let you. And so Netflix wanting to be in business with Fincher, wanting to be in business with Alfonso Cuarón, let them do that. And I think uh, one of the you know the key people in this thing is is of course Schindler's List and and Steven Spielberg. You know you have to have that kind of clout to get a movie like that made and and you know and make it in black and white. It's funny you're either at like the lowest indie yes, run correct. or the highest echelon to yes. make a black and white movie. Yeah, There's no, kind of no either, either, yeah, either, 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 yeah, between. exactly. It's so funny. Um, and you, you know, uh, but a lot of these black and white movies, I was looking to. I was surprised how many like were nominated for best picture or one best picture. I mean, uh, uh, everything we've talked about almost so far in in this little section here: Mank, uh, uh, Roma, Schindler's List. Uh, Mank and Roma were nominated. Schindler's List won. The Artist won. One, yeah. uh, Raging Bull was a biggie that was a you know was, was the, that, that that was nominated for best picture. Uh, you know, shot beautifully the by light, um, the Lighthouse. Wasn't that nominated? Uh, I don't the think ro- it was. was, it was, was it not no, nominated? not nominated for best picture. Really? I don't think so. But uh-huh. I mean, certainly, certainly he's that that it young was in that, that Yeah, it was yeah, in yeah. Zeitgeist for um, sure. Lenny was nominated for Best Picture. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, what about something like Rumblefish? Was Rumblefish nominated? No, it wasn't. No, I but was... I think, I mean, if I, if I had to pick probably my favorite black and white film from this era, it would be it would be Rumblefish. It's funny whenever I think about Rumblefish, I also consider like, okay, it's black and white, but it has splashes of color. Yes. So well, it sort of does that thing where, um, like, Schindler's List has the has the one piece of color in it, and yeah. and Rumblefish has the fish that are in color. Yeah. Um, uh, it's always funny though, but you can tell when you're watching it on a real print. All of a sudden, the, the you know you, the that that sex that that reel with the color thing is printed on color stock, so it doesn't quite look the as, same. As, like the same. I mean, you can on on like you know on 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 your Blu-ray, it looks the same because they they make those edits. But uh, but once again. Francis Ford Coppola. Mm-hmm. Fran- you have to be Francis Ford Coppola. You have to be Coppola to do that. <laughs> to make it. You know, it's, um, it's funny, though, because like, something like Forbidden Planet. Forbidden Planet has a color version and a black and white version. Mm-hmm. And like I've seen only the black and white version. Actually, I've seen both versions. But I think it was black and white first, and then they colorized it. I can't hmm. remember exactly. I don't know. The um, I mean, there's certainly that hip thing that directors do now like something like fury road or uh, or logan where directors you know really actually uh, give you that option at the and 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 a home video or actually re-release it in theaters for you know a little or time godzilla that, minus one yes they did correct that too. they do it in black and white and that stuff's pretty darn cool and actually even uh, go back to bogdanovich for a second uh bogdanovich always insisted that um that i believe that like nickelodeon and texasville should be in black and white so uh before he died he managed to get both those things on 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 video in black and, black and black and white and they certainly both films are helped by it i don't know if both films actually succeed because of it but texasville ha- in color texasville has very not much of a connection to last picture show in black and white it has just a tiny bit more and once again in nickelodeon they're doing silent films so it's, so, it's connecting back to that yeah and i feel like modern audiences when they see a black and white stock they think oh it's old like, yeah. oh, it's old timey. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You automatically kind of go sure. back there that it's supposed to be. But yeah, my sister's on... saying, "Oh, I'm sorry." Oh, I'm so sorry. But well, like... no, the, one of my best Edward screenings, yeah. uh, best slash worst Edward screenings, is um, uh, someone wanted to show it on film, and they got a really crappy print, and so it started, and it was in black and white, and it was skipping, and it was like popping all over the place, and I was like, "Oh my god." It's an Ed Wood movie. <laughs> it feels more <laughs> like an Ed Wood movie than ever. Um, Another movie that was nominated for Best Picture that was black and white, uh, as people forget, was nominated for Best Picture, was Good Night and Good Luck. Which is, oh, yeah. I yeah, always yeah. forget that one was yeah, nominated. Yeah. And once again, I think that's because he's trying to ape uh, 1950s television. Yeah. Uh, you know. I mean, it's funny, though, because like, when I started going through this list, because, um, like for example, like The Ascent. I really love The Ascent. The Ascent is one of the greatest movies it's, of all it's time. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, and it's a, is it Larissa Shep- Shepko? Yeah. Is that her name? Yeah. And she's married to the guy that did Come and See. Yes. I mean, um, we're talking about, is that the most talented couple <laughs> ever? I and mean... also the darkest couple ever. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I don't know if I want to go to a dinner party at the old. <laughs> no, no. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but uh, that movie is beautiful. But also, it's like in that category of, oh, it's foreign, so it's black and white. Yes. So well, there's a there's a whole you know uh, a slew of uh, of international films from this time period. I mean, the more recent ones, I would say, Cold War and uh, and Ida, mm-hmm. uh, both by um, oh, I'm Polish. I should know this. Paweł Palakowski, I think is how you say yeah. his name. And those movies are just stunningly beautiful. But when I think of international black and white films, particularly from this time period, I think in the in the in the um, 
in the seventies, it was really Vim Vendors. Yes, who, Vim you know, Vendors, one movie sure. after another, Kings of the Road, Alice in the Cities, uh, you know, but Robbie Mueller doing the DP work. It's just those those movies are so distinctive. And he kept on doing even State of Things, a movie he makes that's sort of a, a commentary on when he was working with Coppola. Another of the foreign black and whites that I always think of is Tetsuo the Iron Man. Yes. Which is like so yeah. visceral. If people haven't seen it, it's like it's one of those movies that like you gotta see because yeah. it's just it is what it is. But also like when I think of other foreign movies and people don't always think of Canadian as foreign, but like Chan is missing. Yes. Is a great one. And like a girl walks home alone at night. Yes. That's another really great yeah. one. Yeah. Um but and yeah, Bella Tars made a couple, the uh, Tour and Horse and uh, the, what's it, how do you say, Work, work Mars, their Harmonies, and, uh, you know, La Haine is great. Um, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of great international films that were made in black and white. Um, and first movies, too. Like, a lot of directors yes. make their first movies in Well, it's funny, some, so, you know, we're talking about the, you have to be a major auteur or uh, someone starting yeah. out. There's someone who I've definitely put in, in both those categories would be uh, Jim Jarmusch, mm -hmm. you know, who I think um, really, uh, you know, uh, uh, when people were making independent films, there were very few independent films. They started not making them in black and white because they wanted to seem like they were they were sort of like, you know, they, they could play with the big boys a little mm -hmm. bit. There was, you'd still have something like Hester Street by Joan Nicklin Silver in the 70s and things like that, occasionally things like this. But I think when Jarmusch, like, this, this dropped the mic with, um, with uh, 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 why am I... The what's what's the name of that movie? Um, uh, Strange in Paradise. Yeah, you know what I mean. Where it's like literally grain structure is almost like a um uh, <laughs> a character in the film, you know. And then he continued it with Down by Law and Dead Men. Um, you know, and 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 got and once and worked with Robbie Mueller. It sort of like these movies really were incredible to watch and they were in black and white and you felt like a style so even then when spike lee does does she's got to have it mm -hmm. you feel like it's it, it's like almost like uh uh, uh jamush uh lit the match again and you could you, independent filmmakers could sort of make those those movies and so many of the big tours of our time started their first movies in black and white, whether it was Gus Van Zandt with Mala Noche or, uh, or, you know, Kevin Smith and Clerks or Chris Nolan with Following or Aronofsky with Pi, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's Mary Libetique. I mean, once again, even, even when they're going back and looking at these low budget things that started their careers, these are the best DPs in the world. When I was, I actually read something about Clerks recently, which was that it was supposed to be shot in color. And then because they were shooting in like that convenience store, they actually mm -hmm. didn't have enough money to change out all the light bulbs. Okay. And so everything was casting really like blue. And he was like, I don't want it to look this color. And so they said, oh, well, why don't we just shoot it in black and white? And everyone thought it was like this big auteur thing that he That's decided so to shoot in black and white. And he was like, no, it's like literally because I didn't have enough money to change the light bulbs. That's so funny. Uh, he just shot it on video. That would have made more sense, I know. Kevin. Well, it's, it's funny, though, because I also think about like we have – black and white movies that are shot on film and we also have black and white movies that are digital and they just change it to black yeah, and white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like what is the difference between that? Like is it film versus digital black and white? Do you have an opinion on it or is it just black and white is black and white? I kind of uh, think black and white is black and white. You know what I mean? Um, obviously you get that richness in, in film that you don't but it's uh, uh, it, th then it becomes more of going back to what I was saying it literally is an artistic decision you're deciding at some point you're going to make you know you're going to make the uh, you want the film needs to be seen in black and white as opposed to necessarily shot in black and white exactly you know um, one director I want to give a, a shout out because uh, uh, definitely is an artistic decision and a low budget decision uh, at the same time is um, is uh, Guy Madden. I was just gonna say it must be Guy Madden that you're gonna <laughs> shout out the good old. Isn't he from like Winnipeg? Yes, he is. Yeah. My Winnipeg, as yeah. a matter of fact, is where he's from. My Winnipeg, yeah, because black and white, I it's believe. like he and my dad are both the Manitoba guys. Oh my God, I, didn't, yeah. I don't think I knew that. Yeah. Uh, but I love his movies and things like Archangel, Gimli Hospital, Saddest Music in the World. I mean, he just consistently made. Uh, if you guys don't know who Guy Bannon is, he's sort of like um, he makes these movies that uh, he, I mean, he, he makes bigger movies now. But at, uh, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, he made these movies that sort of felt like they were just almost lost Czechoslovakian movies from yeah, 1933. You know, this, this one's not in black and white, but Careful is one of my favorite movies. And Careful just feels like, oh, what is this crazy German film? That, it's, it's like a yodeling picture from uh, from 1932 or something. It's really, um, they're amazing films, and they should they should really be tracked down.
And I feel like 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 the people we're talking about now influence the next generation, which is someone like uh, Andrew uh, Budrolowski. I think that's how you say his name. Once again, I'm the Polish guy who can't pronounce Polish names. I, my, I actually don't pronounce my name correctly. So I feel what, like how is your name supposed to be pronounced? Karaszewski. 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 Wow. I, okay, actually, I'm here the, with Larry Karaszewski exactly. today. <laughs> Milos Roman is the only person ever says. Actually, Janusz Kamenski, who I believe shot, uh, he shot uh, uh, Schindler's List, <laughs> yelled at me one time at her. What is this abomination that you say? You say your name. You know, it's like uh, it's like like Polish people are ashamed of how I say it. But that's just how my family said it. My but dad if, said if it. If that's how you say it, that is your name. Yeah, correct. That's exactly because I I've, I have different right. pronunciations. Don't name name shame me. Yeah, don't, don't name don't shame, shame me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, but mutual appreciation and computer chess and then alex ross perry does the color wheel and there are these sort of also low budget horror movies like uh like the addiction and nadia uh michael and Moreta's movie that uh um, you know like oh, vampire yeah. pictures that are sort yeah, of these like these vampire pictures tend to be in black and yeah. white and i think well, it's because it evokes correct dracula it's ro- nosferatu is gonna exactly. be in black and white yeah. yeah and um you know also it feels like they they these creatures live at night so that black and white world the, that they... The girl that walks home alone yeah, at night also. Exactly, it's like another exactly. example of that, that um, I mentioned. And, uh, you know, a uh, uh, person who probably should be talked about a little bit is Robert Rodriguez, who... Yeah, but who did the Sin City yeah, and... Yeah. It's and just, Sin City. Yeah, who did Sin City and Sin City. He winds up shooting. He winds up another person directs Sin City too, I think. But 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 Rodriguez yeah, yeah. shoots it, which so is funny. Why well, that's probably he... a case of you're saying it's shot digitally, wasn't it? Or, I yeah. think I think because there's so it... much color in that too. It's so it's so. Uh, yeah, but also like, is that because it was supposed to be like a comic book, like yes. noir comic book? So yeah. it, that was like a definite stylistic choice, right? Evoking a certain style. Exactly. I, I like that. And he that. could digitally just change it and do all kinds of stuff in that. The, at the, yeah. I think also the digital aspect allows you to add the pops of color easier. Like mm-hmm. we were mentioning earlier like with Rumblefish, like you can tell in the film stock, like if it's been a color stock or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so it's like when it's shot digital black and white, if you want to have like a lot of color and like a lot of editing and stylistic choices, maybe digital is the better way to go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of times you have almost no choice anymore, you know. Uh, um, uh, the other thing I think we should bring up is, is like there's – um. You know, the rock and roll movies a little bit. Sometimes there's, you know, there's yeah. like uh, the U2 the documentary. Movie, and then uh, the Prince is Under the Cherry Moon. Yeah, Prince is Under the Cherry oh Moon. Oh my God, that's such a fun movie. Yes, I'm, it is. Prince is so confusing to me because he's such a sex symbol, but like yeah. I'm not sure for who, for everyone, I guess. <laughs> for, for, Prince. <laughs> for, for Prince. For Prince. <laughs> Prince loves himself. Um, I was, uh, you know, I, there are people who say this, but I am actually the the one and only the biggest Prince fan of all time. And of all time. So, um, okay, Larry, um, you are the biggest Prince fan of you, all you. time. Thank you. Well, it's official. Now I can actually say, have you ever listen to Gala's uh, podcast she actually <laughs> says I'm the biggest pod, uh, biggest Prince fan of all time but I was there uh, opening night of uh, Under the Cherry Moon you know so um, uh, when I was going through my list mm-hmm. or this list mm-hmm. I went through with my dad I was like dad which ones should I see and he was like well Gala like other people might not like Under the Cherry Moon, but I know you're going to like yeah, it yeah. <laughs> and I loved that movie I got to see it for the first time because of this list well I maintain that if Prince would have actually shot songs for Under the Cherry Moon, he he. For some reason, he decided to shoot in black and white. He decided to fire. He fired Mary Lambert. He went and he, he decided to direct it himself. <laughs> and then he decided to, to not put songs in it. I mean, there's girls and boys, and that's really the only number that actually works in that's in the film. I believe there's, well, there's, there's the soundtrack there's is kiss. There's kiss in the car. Yeah, but like you're right, boys well, and girls. Not it's not a number. No, yeah, it's yeah. just like uh, girls and boys. Uh, the um uh, so like if he had thrown in five musical numbers, because I was there, I was there at the Man Village in Westwood and when friggin when they were so everyone was so excited because he was the biggest rock star in the world everyone was so excited the place was packed they were ready for Purple Rain 2 and they were gonna go they would take they'd go anywhere the meme was shooting black and white shoot this silly thing in Paris all this kind of stuff but if he gave us a friggin rock and roll number every 10 minutes because when girls and boys comes on the place exploded that's wow. what they really wanted and then you know it's one of the biggest bombs of all time yeah but it was really fun to watch yeah. and i th- personally i think it holds up but you can tell like prince is just having fun yeah like in my opinion i think he's just there to have fun yeah and he's just there to make something that he wants to make and you got jerome who is so yeah, great yeah, jerome, <laughs> jerome. that's the thing also is like art some artists make things because they feel the need yes. that they feel the burning desire right. to create rather than for money or success like yeah. you have artists that 
create for others and you have artists that create for themselves. Yeah. I think Prince is definitely Prince creating definitely. for himself. Prince always created for himself. And that, that, that's what makes him, uh, you know, it's really funny because, uh, uh, you know, people were very confused by Prince in the beginning of his career and for the last 20 years of his career. Like, um, uh, you know, uh, I'll, be, I'll, I'll do my bona fides. I saw Prince, first time I saw my concert was a Dirty Mind Tour. So I, I went way, way, way back. I feel like but I'm going to last... need to get you back on the mic to talk about Prince. Oh, I'd love to do that. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> that, that could be our next thing. I would yeah. love to do that. Um, uh, so, you know, people really could not figure out what he was doing when he went into the wilderness. And, um, and when he died... Then it all was forgiven. You know, it's one of those yeah. things right now. Then it was like, oh my God, every, you could find three tracks on every freaking album. But Well, that's that's like what my, because like I'm not a huge Coen Brothers fan, like mm-hmm. of their movies, but my dad always tells me, he's like, Gala, when they're gone, yeah. you're going to be sorry. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. he always says, even a bad Coen Brothers movie, yeah. when they're not making movies anymore, yeah. it's going to be a great movie. Yeah, yeah. Well, I feel that way. Um, I was close to Norm MacDonald. Yeah. And Norm MacDonald uh, was God. obviously a, a, a big career, and he's a, he, he was you know a successful comedian. I made a movie with him. Um, I made three movies with him. Uh, but um, man, the second he died, you know, people got him. Yeah, that's it, it's really strange. It they is were like really they were strange. like the people were not paying attention to Norm MacDonald. And, I, and I when remember... you die, you can put him in context. It's like it's like I when it's three a.m. I'm clicking on Norm MacDonald. I shows. have I have one friend who is like a diehard Norm MacDonald fan, mm-hmm. and when he died, it was devastating to him. Mm-hmm. And I remember I ran a film club at the time, so all day that day he just marathoned yeah. like, for the public. Like if anyone wanted to come and watch it, you could come and watch the Norm MacDonald movie. Yeah, yeah. Him. It was the first time I had ever really been introduced to him. Oh, his honestly. stuff is so freaking funny. And he funny. is really he yeah. a really good impersonation of Quentin. Oh, yes, he does. I don't know. Hey, you know, yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing, man. <laughs> it's probably one of the best ones I've yeah, seen. Yeah, it is really good. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, music and the documentaries, like we were saying, uh, we're saying a YouTube movie. And, and also, I wanted to, when we move over to documentaries, I want to give a shout out to uh, 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 Frederick Wiseman, who mm-hmm. made from like the late 60s to uh, like 1980, I think, a series of these. They're the greatest documentaries ever made. And, they're, and that, this was a cost thing. This was he, you know, he um, uh, um, uh, would shoot these movies in black and white stuff like Titicut Follies and High School, Hospital, Welfare, Model. I think Model was shot in black and white as well. And because Wiseman just just basically sits you down in a location. Mm-hmm. I mean, even the titles I'm giving you, like High School, Hospital. Like you uh, know exactly what you're getting. You know exactly. And, and, and it's not like he's trying to make necessarily a movie out of it, but he makes the best movie um, that possible about it because you literally are just there with the people and you're watching uh, what what happens. I think juvenile courts another thing like this, and a lot of them have these these topics that are uh, that are on the depressing side. But if you actually just watch the films, um, I think you can see the, most of them on Canopy. And I think the Cinematheque is doing a, a retrospective right now, but Canopy is a great place to watch the Frederick Wiseman movies. Um, uh, you're watching the stuff in real time. And so you're not, you're not. Uh, uh, I think any any time you're filming something, you're changing it, and you're you're having a, a point of view on it. But uh, Wiseman tries as much as possible to remove that and just like let you actually understand the human beings behind all these things. And they're they're fascinating movies. And even today, uh, I think he's you know he's he's a very old guy, but he's still knocking movies out. I mean, if you get a chance, this is a color film, but watch the watch the I think four or five hour movie he made a couple of years ago on the French restaurant. Oh. Oh my wow, goodness! Oh time. my goodness! Wow, we did pretty good. We did pretty good. We did pretty good. Well, um, let's see. Is there anything that we didn't? Uh, we didn't. Well, uh, so- Soderbergh had made a couple like Kafka and um, and the Good German, but that's a, those are fine movies just to add at the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is all the time that we have for today. But Larry, okay. is there any final thought that you want to share? Um, no. This was this was. <laughs> I was. I like. Yeah, she made fun of me earlier because I'm the only guest that said no. I have nothing else. To yeah, say last to time you. Larry was like, nope, I'm done. <laughs> Um, I think we did really good I think, here. So I have one question before we end. Okay. If you were going to recommend to someone one black and white movie in the color era for them to watch, Rumblefish. 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 Paper Moon. I think those two would be the like the kind of ease, gateway gateway drugs exactly because I know like some this. people that are kind of intimidated by black and white. Yeah, no, those those are really super entertaining, good movies. Uh, I think you'll dig them. They're not like you know a lot of people have that thing. Oh, black and white's depressing, and they're but neither one of those are depressing. I'm looking. At, there's a lot of depressing movies on this list. Uh, 
<laughs> there, there are a lot of yeah, serious looking, depressing. Really yeah, those are the, those are the two. I think um, you know, obviously, you, you know, because you can show them something like Young Frankenstein or The Artist, like this, but that doesn't really. They, I think they'll just feel like those are old movies. Yeah. Um, and I guess you could say that a little even about. Um, but uh, Rumblefish, you definitely don't feel that. Yeah, you definitely don't feel that way. You, a little bit about uh, maybe in, in Paper Moon, but um, uh, yeah. And the, the, but those would be the two. Those are the two fun ones. That is it for today. Thank you so much, Larry, for coming onto the show. You can keep up with Larry on his Instagram at Larry underscore Karazuski. The last name is spelled K A R A S Z E W S K I. And actually, I would say uh, you mentioned this earlier. Uh, find me on Letterbox, which is just my name, I think. And 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 um, uh, I think it's Larry Zuski, like your actual handle. But oh, you can maybe. find you under Larry Karazuski. Yeah, Larry Karazuski, Larry Zuski, whatever. But find uh, and there is this list. I'll share this list in the Fine. description below so okay, everyone good. can go and click on it but this list is really <laughs> you and really I are fighting now which which letterbox <laughs> list are you like my list or her list? no i'll share you i'll <laughs> share your list i'll sh- i don't have a list like this this is a very comprehensive yes, list in movies anyone, that we haven't even talked about i know there's so many i think there's like 116 movies something like, or something you'd be surprised it. how many we got through i'm shocked at how i'm many we so got through. proud of us yeah, so I, oh, yeah. i'm gala avery and this has been the gala show The Gala Show is brought to you by Avery.com. This episode was executive produced by Roger Avery and produced by Gala Avery. Music composed by Andy Milburn. As always, I'm your host, Gala Avery. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved. Despite me sharing the same last name with this charity, I don't have any affiliation with it, besides the fact that the issue is very near and dear to my heart. Did you know that in the United States, 2.7 million children currently have a parent in prison, and it's estimated that 10 million children have experienced parental incarceration at some point in their lives? I was one of these kids, and as an adult, I am really grateful to be able to give back to Project Avery. Their mission is to build leadership from within by supporting community through programs such as mentoring and outdoor education, and also to remove the stigma surrounding having a parent that's incarcerated. You don't have to feel alone. If you know a kid who could use these resources or would like to donate money or time to the charity, please go to Project Avery, that's A-V-A-R-Y dot org, to check out what this amazing charity is all about. Again, that's projectavery.org. Thank you guys from the bottom of my heart.